want to thank Andy and the worship team. Thanks, Bubba. You did a good job again today. I am so glad that you are here. Um, I say this uh, most weeks that uh, this is one of the best hours we get to spend all week long. More than that is the fact that um, we get so used to God being the perfect provider for us that we also forget that God is a need meter. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you've come in here today and that you have a need, I pray that God meets it. He is capable of doing anything that you've ever asked, hoped, or imagined. And so no matter what your situation is, listen to me carefully, no matter what you are going through, God can meet your need. And so I just encourage you today to lean into him, trust him. And I pray that when we leave here in about 25 minutes or so, that you will be moved not by the power of my words. You will not be moved by the power of the songs, but you'll be moved by the power of the Holy Spirit, that God will just transform your life. So today is the last part in this series, What Did You Expect? It is part five. Somebody joked after the first service, they said, to be honest, what I expected was part six, because you can never get anything done on time. But today is the day. It is, uh, it is it, one day has come. This is the glorious day. It has happened. We are going to be done with this series. I'll be honest, um, and, I, and I think I've shared this before, that I wrote this message series back in February, assuming it was for March. And really felt like God wanted us to go a different direction. And we did uh, over the last eight or nine weeks. And then we, we began this one here in late May and now into June. Uh, this was for now. This was for you now. There have been so many people who have been set free from the bondage of the expectations from their past. Do you understand that we entitled the message, What Did You Expect? Your expectations are based on your past experiences. If you grew up and you had a great experience as a child through adolescence into young adulthood, you usually have a greater sense of expectation into, in, into your mature years. But, it, but, but likewise, if you've had a poor upbringing and you've had some bad things happen to you, your expectations are lowered and because of your experiences. And then in life, it continues to, to do the very same thing. You have less of an expectation. What did you expect? What do you expect from the day? Did you come in here today anticipating that God would do something for you? Or did you come in expecting God to check your name off the clipboard list that you made it one more time into a church? What did you expect? Uh, it really comes down to it. Did you expect to be entertained by me today? Or did you expect to have God speak through me today? What did you expect? Did you expect that someone would buy you lunch today? Or did you expect you were going to have to make your own? I am on the first part. I am still looking for someone to buy me lunch today. So that's what I'm expecting. Just, I, I, I didn't say it in the first service, but nobody moved by the Holy Spirit's power. So I am intervening on behalf of that. I'm telling you that now. What did you expect? The Bible says this, Acts chapter 3. If you've got your Bibles, you want to turn there. We're going to look at the first five verses. I'm going to do about two minutes of review to bring everybody up to snuff. And I have been waiting. I promise you today, guess what? Today we get to see the miracle happen. He walks today. We get to see it with our own eyes. The beggar walks today. The man that was crippled, I promise you, we'll watch him walk today. But we got to go back over the first five verses. So verse 1 of Acts chapter 3 says this. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. It was uh, 3 in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day. Imagine, he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. There's where we get the title for the message series. What did you expect by that last line, verse 5? He gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. You will often give your attention to something that you are expecting a return on. We normally don't invest in things unless there's an expectation that you're going to get something back in return. When, I, when I, I, I'm amazed, I actually spent three weeks on these five verses alone. You need to get the message series if you really want to catch up. All I want to say to you is that key line that moves me beyond compare is it said where he was put every day. I'm here to tell you, folks, there is something about this guy that, that captures my uh, attention. I am I'm mesmerized by him. Every day he paid somebody to take him to the temple gate called Beautiful. Not some days, every day. Not every other day. Every day. What do you do every day? 
Why would anyone want to do this every day? We, we talked about it historically. This is not a place for beggars to be. They're not even allowed here. And there's no money to be made at church. <laughs> they understood the joke. The rest of you don't. <laughs> Laugh uncomfortably right now. It would be really good for you just go, <laughs> he's funny. I like him. But I'm uncomfortable. Okay, so stay with me. There it is. See, I love that. It, it's not a slower section. They're just the, the, the volume doesn't get there for like three seconds. It's a delay to that section of the, of the place. Every day he goes to the temple court and he begs. But we discovered that I don't believe he was coming here to beg because this is not the place to make money. At the temple courts, there was five steps, much like our stage that led up to the court of women. He was not allowed on the inside because of his crippling. His affliction, his, uh, his effect, what has affected him did not allow him to go inside. He was on the outside. I believe that he was placed at the top step because he wanted to be as close to God as he could get. So that when God was ready to move, he was there. If you do something every day of your life and you're brought to the temple courts, why would you do that? Because in that culture, he believed to understand that this was where the presence of God was at. And he wanted to be as close to God as he could get. And if that be the case, I will pay somebody to bring me every day to sit there and beg not for money as much as a miracle. So I say to you, what are you doing every day to save your marriage? What are you doing every day to repair the financial despair in your life? What are you doing every day to ask God for that miracle or that healing? What are you committed to every day? Are you drawing as close to God's presence as you possibly can every day? Or is it a prayer you toss up every time you get disappointed? Hmm. It always gets uncomfortably quiet in here when the pastor raises his voice. But I wonder if God isn't speaking to us today about what are we committed to do. Let me pray, and we're going to jump in. Father, this is yours. Uh, I, I, I got to get out of the way. So I promise with all my heart, mind, and soul, God, that today we will see the miracle. But Lord, remind us of where we're at how dare we, God, even assume that you would even listen to us, and yet you are mesmerized by us. You love us. God, that absolutely humbles me. And Lord, today, just remind us that no matter what condition we're in, no matter how we got to this spot, God, you have been waiting for this moment. You have wanted to speak into our lives. There, is, there are people who have traveled hundreds of miles who have come here. They're on vacation. They, they drove by, saw the sign. There are those who are visiting family members who are here today. They just thought this was part of the routine of their, of their, of their break, of their vacation. But God, you brought them here today because you want to speak in their lives. There is someone here this morning, Lord, I believe with all my heart, who has been coming here for years and has never heard from you. And today is the day. God, would you reach out and touch us? Would you remind us of our value and the fact that we too can experience healing? And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, so let's look at verses 6, 7, and 8. The Bible says in verse 6, so Peter said to him, silver or gold I do not have. Remember, he asked for money. But what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, Peter helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. And then, this is the kubar, and then he got to go into the temple courts with them. Can you imagine his whole life? He had waited to go inside. He sat outside here every day. Now he gets to go in. I must contain myself. That's at the near the end. You'll notice when the squirrel gets a little more hyper, we're near the end, okay? So stay with me. Walking and jumping and praising God. Oh, I can't imagine. I, I, I promised the first service I would not leave the stage, but I may in this one. So stay with me on this. So here it is. Let me go back, and I want to look at verse 6. Verse 6 is from last week. i got to bring you up to date on this so you're all with me. Verse 6 says this. Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now, I want to just say to you, I have the contention to believe that there were people in his life at different times who had prayed over him and said, now walk. And he couldn't move. 
I believe there was at some point in his life he'd been taken to a doctor or a doctor came to see him, gave him some pills, rubbed some ointment on it, said, I believe you should be able to walk now, and he still couldn't move. I wonder how many times he would awaken in the morning thinking he had a nightmare that, that, that maybe it was just all a crazy dream, and he would try to get up and walk, and nothing and now Peter and John, two disciples of Christ, simply toss out this line and say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. How does this make it any different? Now, I just want to say to you that, that there is a key thing that I find wrong with this. And I'm not arguing with the writer of it, but I want to just show it to you because you could be lulled into believing what, what's going on here. It says Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, can I say to you that his father is from Bethlehem. His mother is from Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. For two years they were in Egypt. They came back and they stayed in Nazareth. But in this culture, he would not be referred to as Jesus Christ of Nazareth, his mother's homeland. Have you ever watched the great epic movie Braveheart? Have you ever watched anyone? No, anyone with that one? Yeah, okay, a handful of us are honest about that. You know, what about Robin Hood, Men in Tights? Anyone there? Okay, a lot. Okay, see, I know the quality of my audience now. Okay. Robin of Loxley, right? They refer to him as Robin of Loxley. Why Rock Loxley? Because his father was from Loxley. Braveheart, what was Braveheart's name? It was William Wallace. And where was he from? Where? Scotland. But there was a town they mentioned. Luke, go watch the movie. Come back and let us know what the deal is. Do not, yeah, exactly. Lucas would do that. He's already in a dream. Okay, so here it is. It is culturally sensitive to the fact that if you were ever referred to, you were referred to back to your father's land. He would have been called Jesus Christ of Bethlehem. Why then was he called Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Because it was an insult. It was a name given to him to judge him and say he was less than. It was a name that those around him knew and said about him. Matter of fact, when Philip came and told his brother Nathaniel, you must come meet this Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? John 19, 19, when Pilate had Jesus crucified on the cross, he had a sign made, and he said, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Remember the priest wanted them to take down the King of the Jews? They didn't mind the Nazareth part because they too believed that nothing good come, 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 could come out of Nazareth. Can I say to you that we discovered that Nazareth actually was a town 65 miles outside of Jerusalem. Nazareth never had a cement block made. It was a tent city for refugees, for people who were outcasts. That's where Jesus was from. Nazareth actually means sprout. Not much is what it means. And so when this beggar hears that he can walk in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, something resonates within his spirit. Because Jesus is just like him. Did you, did you hear it? Jesus is just like him. He don't come from much either. If somebody looked at him, they wouldn't expect much. There's not much about this guy. He's a beggar. He's been from the other side of the tracks. What I love about our God is he never forgot about us. He never forgot who we are and who we would become. And so when he says, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, do you understand that God loves you and he identifies with every broken part of you because his son was insulted. His son was an outcast. His son Jesus was looked down upon. His son Jesus was wrongly judged. He was criticized and beaten and neglected. Sounds a lot like us. And I love that about God, that he never forgot who we would be. And so this beggar, when he hears in the name of Jesus Christ, of not much, of Nazareth, Walk. This just might be his chance. Because that's the kind of guy I identify with. Because he identifies with me. So here it is, verse 7. This is where we want to be today. Verse 7 says, taking him by the hand, by the right hand actually, Peter helped him up and instantly his, the man's feet and ankles became strong. Uh, let me just say, I, I want to look at that first line. Uh, remember we talked back to verse 3, that in this culture, it would have been unusual for a, a, a person to even make eye contact with this beggar. This beggar uh, probably spent his life with his head down, his cup up, asking for money. And so when Peter said, look at us, and, and, and the beggar looked at him, that was unusual. That had broken cultural standards. But can I say to you that when the Bible says, taking him by the right hand, 
This is just not allowed. Why in the world would Peter reach out and touch this man's hand? He has no idea where it's been. He doesn't know what diseases he carries. But isn't it beautiful that, that sometimes we need a hand to get up? Sometimes we need a hand to get up, and it doesn't matter where it comes from, and it doesn't matter what condition we're in. Peter reaches out and grabs his hand and lifts him up. Our, our firstborn son, we made a lot of mistakes with our children, but our first one we messed up a lot with. And um, we don't know where he's at now, but it doesn't matter. So anyways, um, we lost him like nine years ago in Myers. But um, <laughs> and he, when Andrew was, was just little, maybe about a year and a half old, he would take naps in the afternoon. And, uh, and, and his favorite thing was when he, would, when he would get up, he would yell, I waked up. And, and, and the waked part he dropped like the E and the A, and it was, a, it was a weird thing. We thought he was Scottish, and then we knew maybe we got the wrong baby. You know, maybe, maybe they did give us the wrong one. And I remember one day going into the, um, going into the little nursery's little room, and, and Andrew had discovered at that time that um, there was stuff in his diaper. <laughs> and he wanted to play with it. <laughs> so you, some of you have caught up. It was a crappy kind of thing that was going on, a situation and so he had his hands up, and when I had put him down for a nap, he was Caucasian. When I went to get him, he was Latino. And so I just, all I know, all I know, he's covered. And that's the moment when I realized as a father, this is creativeness. I just said, honey, can you get the baby? I'm in the bathroom. And I ran in there. Because he smelt bad. I knew where those hands had been when I seen him out there. I'm like, okay. Taking him by the right hand, Peter helps him up. Can you imagine? I wonder how much of our culture has gotten to the point, and think about this, folks, how much of what we are doing right now in our society is what this man had to put up with simply by, by, by the fact that he was crippled. Nobody looked at him. Nobody cared about him. Nobody touched him. I mean, he, he's being looked at for the first time. He's asked, he's asked to look at them. And then Peter reaches out and takes him by the right hand. See, in our society, we are pulling away from human touch, aren't we? We're drawing into our computers. There are more home-based businesses where we don't even ever make personal contact with anybody. We are getting to the point where we do everything by, by, by text messages or emails or ordering even our, our food online. Uh, everything happens, and so we have disconnected from society. We are, we are tweeting and Twitter and whatever. I'm on Twitter now, by the way. I mean, I know a lot of famous people are. I'm there too now, so um, <laughs> twit me or whatever whenever you get a chance. But anyways... Um, um, I hate saying tweet me because that sounds wrong, so I just say twit me. So anyways, um, it's how I was raised, all right? It's how I was raised. Not like you folks, so. But we, we have disconnected, have we not? We've pulled back from society. This man has lived his life pulled back from society. Nobody touches him. Nobody reaches out. There is no human contact. He doesn't have many people who care about him enough to touch him. I had made a conscious decision when we started Westside Community Church eight and a half years ago. And the conscious decision I had made is that I would be at the front door every Sunday that I'm here. Coming or going, you're going to meet John Clark. You're going to meet the pastor. If I'm on the property, you're probably going to get a handshake or a hug. Some of you I hugged today. I know you don't like to be hugged. Sorry. Because <laughs> I think it is in that physical human contact when it's appropriate that we feel loved and valued. See, growing up as a child in a single home where I watched my father die at age six and then my mother had to work a lot of jobs just to make us uh, get by. Being the youngest of four children and often in many ways, and I'm not whining about it, I just realized that I was forgotten and abandoned a lot of times. And I think growing up that way, there is a need to feel like you are loved. My mama did a great job of loving me and I'm not questioning that at all. But I knew what it meant to be hugged. I knew what it meant to have somebody hold my hand. I knew what it meant for somebody to look me in the eyes and say that I mattered and that they loved me and that they cared about me. So when we started Westside Community Church, it was a conscious effort of mine to be at that front door so that when you came here, you knew that somebody did love you. It's why I look you in the eye. It's why I try to remember your name. It's why I embrace you and tell you I'm glad you're here. There is something about that physical contact that communicates that you are among family and it is safe and you are loved. Taking him by the right hand, Peter helps him up. 
I wonder how many of us had needed somebody to help us up. And so here he's being lifted up to his position. I'm, I'm here to say to you today that there are, there are times in our life that no matter how much we struggle, no matter how much we push, there is nothing we can do within our own power to get ourselves back up. You will have to have somebody help you up. You want to know two things keep us down more than anything else. One is pain and two is pride. Pain is we believe because of what has crippled us, we don't even want to attempt to get back up because it's going to hurt some more. But pride is even worse. I, I, I find it almost mesmerizing the sheer numbers of people that I have talked to who have told me about their marriage struggles. And in, in the middle of counseling them, I will often say, why didn't you come and call me? Why weren't you here two years ago? Why, why didn't you reach out and say something? And almost in split, every time I will hear them say, well, we, we didn't want people to know what was going on. We thought we could handle it ourselves. The guy with financial trouble who finally tips his hand and says, I, I'm behind six months. I don't, I don't even know what to do. And I'll, and I'll say, why didn't you come to me a year ago? If you would have said something a year ago, we could have helped you. Why didn't you call a counselor? Why didn't you call some financial expert? And he said, I didn't want anybody to know. I was too embarrassed to tell people what was going on. I was trying to fix it myself. The Bible says pride comes before the fall. One of the reasons why we need a hand to get back up is because the pain sometimes is too much and our pride has put us in that spot. God wants you to get back up. The Bible says the next word is instantly, and I, and I got to move on. I, I, I got I to get to these next things. Instantly, and I, and I love this word because his weight was over. He was on his way up. He was going to be on his way up. His weight was over. And what's interesting is the Bible says uh, that, that, that Peter, taking him by the right hand, helped him up. And in a few days, the man's feet and ankles got better, right? No? What, what does it say? The next day, the man's feet and ankles became strong. Is that what it says? The day after tomorrow, the man's feet and ankles became strong. Take these three pills, and in 72 hours, the man became strong. No, what does it say? Instantly. I love that about God. God wants to heal you now. I like that. Here's the key, Leslie. I wasn't looking for the clap. I was looking for the healing. I didn't know if I had that in me. I didn't know if I didn't want to hit some people in the head. I mean, there's some people I'd like to do that to. Anyway, so stay with me. I'm an adult sufferer of ADD. Leave me alone. Squirrel. His weight was over. You should do a study, not now, but sometime this week on the word suddenly. You will find in the Bible that what God does, he does suddenly. God doesn't mess around or play around. When he wants to do something, it happens now. The Bible says we will be gone in a twinkling of an eye. We are but a vapor here. It happens like that. It just happens, happens, happens. Instantly the man's weight was over. But here's the key, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, and I must tell you it again, because here's the problem. We are not good about waiting, are we? We don't like to wait. Because here's the struggle we have with waiting. When we hear wait upon God, we think it looks like this. Huh? Hey! -o! Right? And we discovered a few weeks ago that when you are told to wait upon God, it is to be in the manner of that of a waiter. That while you wait for him, you are serving him. While you are waiting for him, you are praising him. While you are waiting for him, you are giving him glory. While you are waiting for him, you are moving. Have you ever thought to yourself, because you are standing here all grumpy and pussy, expecting God to answer your prayer, <laughs> that if you would only move and be serving God over here, that it was here that God wants to do it for you? How dare you assume that God will come there because you're disgusted with the fact that he hasn't shown up on time when God is just waiting for you to serve him. Maybe it is when you're worshiping over here, this is where God wanted to move in your life. How will you ever know what God's going to do if you stay put and wait here like an amoeba, curled up in a position saying, God, I will wait here forever. This man was carried here every day and then carried home and then carried right back to this spot. He was moving the entire time. He was active with it, but when his weight was over it was instantaneous i remember as a kid my two older brothers evil men <laughs> and, I, and this is helping me by the way this is helping get a lot of stuff out uh they were cruel to me as a child 
they had built a tree fort. And uh, finally, I was probably about 10 years old, and the day had come that I was going to get to go up into the tree fort. I was never allowed. They would call me over and throw stuff down onto me, and then I'd run away. So like this day, they were both down on the ground, and they said to me, you can go up now. And I thought, this is it. I didn't know if Spider-Man was up there or Batman and Robin. I didn't know if they had a light show. I had no idea what was in the tree fort. So this old hemlock tree had these two-by-fours with rusty nails on them, and I began to climb. Not as much fun as I thought it would be climbing that ladder on the tree. These boys were terrible carpenters. And so anyways, I would climb up, and I got up into the tree fort. And when I got in there, first thing I saw, and I will say to you, that I am not afraid of bees, not afraid of a pack of snakes, but God has made a wolf spider that can move and jump. It was in there. They sent me up to get it out. Listen, I, I don't remember using the stairs on the way down. I think I did that whole <laughs> out of there. This is what I waited for. There was no Batman and Robin. There was nasty spiders up there. That's why they sent me up. It was not worth waiting for. <laughs> but I wonder if that's where you're at today. You wonder if what you're waiting for is worth it. Can I say to you that it is? When God moves in your life, it'll be instantaneous. I pray he does that today. I pray you do not leave here without God moving instantaneously. I must move on. The, the, next, the next thing I, I find amazing, it says, the man's feet and ankles became strong. It doesn't take much to keep us down. Did you catch it? It doesn't take much to keep us down. It was his feet and ankles, less than four inches above the ground. From here down is what kept this man down. His head was fine. His heart was fine. His back was fine. His legs were fine. It was his feet and his ankles. When I first read that, I began to realize that it was less than 2% of the total makeup of his body is what was keeping him down. What was causing him to be collapsed to the ground was just these, his feet and ankles. I guess why that moved me so much was the fact that, that it wasn't much. I mean, I mean, if you would have said that his back had gone out, I, I've known people who've had bad backs, and, and easily, if you've had a heart attack, yes, you, you're probably down for a while, but it was that it was his feet and ankles. It doesn't seem like a lot in the beginning, right? And I began to consider my own life, and what has kept me down hadn't been all that much either. I wonder if it's, if, if what's keeping you down is the memory of that one moment years ago that you somehow can't shake from your mind. I wonder if that's what keeps you down. I, I wonder if it's the heartache of, of having your heart broken and, and somehow, some way, when that took place, you thought to yourself, I will never love a soul again. And so that has kept you down. It isn't much. You hardly notice it. It's less than 2% of the total of who you are. But, but that's what's kept you down. I wonder if it's the fact that God didn't answer a prayer for you. I wonder if you prayed something and you asked God just this one time, God, I need you to come through. And he didn't. I wonder if that's what's keeping you down. I don't know why God didn't answer the prayer the way you asked it. But I want you to know it has nothing to do with you. See, it's, it's always just something very small that seems to keep us down. I'm here to tell you today that God looks down upon this moment, and the only thing he wants you to know and to walk away from this place with is that he loves you. He finds you irresistible and irreplaceable. God just wants you to know that you have captured his attention and so for whatever's broken your heart, whatever memory you still have stuck, whatever prayer he did not answer, God wants you one more time to trust him. Because see, I'm afraid that what's been keeping you down is less than you realize, but it's become so much to you, you don't even know what it feels like to walk. Can you imagine this man? Instantly, his feet and his ankles became strong. What would that felt like to have the, 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 the reaction of the nervous system and the muscles beginning to all move about, going down, shooting down his legs? I wonder what he felt. He's never felt this before. He's never walked a day in his life. How would he even know what it feels like to walk? 
What would the sensation on the soles of his feet be like? What would the resonating emotion be like? He has no history to draw from to determine what will happen next. And then I began to realize that happens with you also. See, if you've never felt valued, and I tell you that God finds you irresistible, you have nothing to draw from to sense your importance. If I say to you that God loves you and you've never felt like you mattered to anyone, you have nothing to draw from to understand your significance. If I say that God can forgive you of anything you've done and you've been told your whole life that you're not worth much, then you have very little to draw from. In your wildest imagination, in your greatest of dreams, how could you even determine what God would do? I guess it's based in our expectations, isn't it? If you don't expect much, then you're probably not going to get much. But is it possible today that when he moves in your life, this is the moment when you begin to feel those sensations and you say, no matter what, I'm going to walk today. I'm getting up. I feel like I'm getting stronger and stronger and stronger. The last verse and we're done. Verse 8. Verse 8 says, the man jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts and walking and jumping and praising God. I, I don't have time to go into it, but, but I want you to capture this moment. Look at the middle part. He is finally free. He got to go into the temple courts. This is the moment he'd been waiting. He had heard about this and, and he'd heard the prayers and the songs and now he's in there. Can you imagine? I, I, don't, I don't, I just, I, to be finally free. I've said to you before that I think heaven's going to be everything you've ever wanted. I mean, it, it's going to be your wildest imagination. What do you really want to spend the rest of your life doing? I want to spend the rest of my life in a chocolate factory. That's all I want. Just licking stuff. I don't care what it is. Just chocolate. Licking stuff. I mean, I would be mesmerized. That's him. He's like a kid in a candy store. He's in there. And, and then the Bible says that, 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 that he jumped to his feet. And then walking and jumping and praising God. Hey, listen. He'd been down long enough. Nobody's keeping him down. I, I, I want to jump so bad. Um, I can't because when I jump, I look feminine. But anyways, because I always kick my heels and put my pinky out. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know, so I'm not going to, can you imagine, he was just walking and jumping, and, and what a powerful scene. And I say to you, I say to you folks, may it happen to you today, may when you finally leave here, maybe it happens in the moments you're here, but instantaneously, God moves in your life, heals your marriages, your finances, your business, your broken heart with God. He heals it, and you can't stay on the ground. Listen, when you've been down so long, you have no choice to go back up. There is coming a day. When God will do that for you. Listen, you better be ready. You better be ready because when he does it, it's instantaneously. Andy, you need to come. It's almost time. Come up here, guys, real quick. I, I want to say to you this morning, as we kind of wrap up, I want you to catch the last line. I'm panting, Andy. They've worn me out today. It's all this weight loss and this working out. It's killing me. I did, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't work out either. I mean... I tried to flex really hard, but it just didn't happen. Would you stand with me this morning? Don't, don't, don't lose contact. I want you to catch the last verse. I always say to you this is the last verse. This is the last verse, I promise. Verses 9 and 10. It says, all the people recognized him as the same man who used to sit at the temple gate begging. All of them recognized him as the same man who used to, same but different. How can you be the same but different? How can you be the same who used to? How can you be the same but different? Guess what? You're looking at him. For I am the same man, but I am different. Because of what God did in my life, it changed everything about me. Oh, to be the same man that is recognized but different. And you've done some things. That I will not tell the people about today. Yes, exactly. 
You are the same man, but different. There was a, could be said over your life, who used to, and then you fill in the blank. But look what God has done. May that be your story over your life. May we be recognized for years to come as the same people who used to. Didn't you used to be angry? Didn't you used to be depressed? Didn't you used to be addicted? Didn't you used to live paycheck to paycheck? Didn't you used to be despondent? Yeah, that was me. I'm the same guy, but different. And then I wonder, Andy, I really do. I wonder how many times as he went into the temple court after that day, he never needed to be carried again. But I wonder if he ever got to the top step just before walking in, peered over his shoulder to the right and thought I used to sit right there begging. Hmm. May we never forget where we came from, but hang on to the promise of where we're going. Folks, we are moving on and we are moving up and God has so much more for you. Raise your expectations, not based on your past experiences, but on who died on the cross for your sins. Jesus Christ of Nazareth says to you, walk, awaken, rise. Church, we need to praise him for the fact that he is our great healer. Amen.